Byron, I know it's uh, still fresh for you right now, but uh, has it soaked in a little bit? Give us an idea of the emotions that you're going through right now. You no, know, it hasn't really sunk in yet. You know, I've just been having this surreal training camp where, you know, everything has been stress-free. Um, Duke, Rufus, and Dean Thomas have done a phenomenal job preparing me, giving me the confidence. I've had some amazing training partners, and um, I was just nervous that I wasn't nervous. And some just told me, you got to enjoy this moment. You've been in this sport for 10 years, and you've never enjoyed the moment. You never received the walkout crowd. And um, I just felt confident to enjoy this moment. I knew I was going to be the world champion. You told me that you saw yourself knocking him out. Was yeah. there something, I mean, was it that right hand that you thought it was going to be? And is there something in his tendencies that, that you thought that was going to be there? You know, I, I saw myself several times knocking him out in several different rounds, and I visualize it over and over again. I, I do a lot of visualization, but um, it wasn't something, a chink in his armor that really showed me that. It was just, I knew he would be thinking about my wrestling. I knew he would be thinking about my right hand. So we had several different um, plays, as we call them, to get to that right hand or get to a powerful punch. And we didn't get to see the interview, but apparently following social media, you said you like Nick Diaz as the first uh, defensive. You know, I want to make some money now. I'm going to be honest. You know, the goal one is to be the world to weight champion in the world, but I put in too much time. I'm around. I'm away from my family way too often. Um, this is a sport where we can make cash now. So instead of just saying this person deserves and he worked his way through the rank, you know, I think Nick Diaz comes off suspension in, in two days. I would love to fight him on 202. You know, I know his brother's fighting. I think he deserves it. He's a guy that's been around the sport. He put a lot of butts in the seat, sold a lot of pay-per-views. So why not put him on a big car with Connor and his brother? I know he's training already and let him cash out. So I'm willing to give him that opportunity. Or I would like to fight George St. Pierre in New York City. A lot of people are saying Stephen Thompson should get that first shot. Does that not interest you? Stephen Thompson said he wanted to fight Robbie Lawler. He said it was a better matchup. The fans would be excited to watch it. He'll get an opportunity to have that fight. Thanks, Darren. Just go over here in the front. Mr. Woodley, um, being that you're a big uh, part of um, the Ferguson community and all this going on over the past summer, what does this victory mean for your community of Ferguson? It means a ton, you know. Um, I said this in uh, several interviews. In 1996, Muhammad Ali lit the torch here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I think it's him passing the torch when he passed this year to pass it to us athletes, not just African American, all athletes, to use our platform to impact, to inspire, to give back to our community. So I'm excited for this because I'm one of the athletes that have, have taken that charge. I'm okay with going out there and giving back to our community, talking to our youth. And, um, you know, it, it means the world to me because I'm a kid that grew up in Ferguson. You know, a lot of people told me I wasn't going to be something or do something, and I've always proved everybody wrong. A lot of people didn't think I deserved this shot. They didn't think I should be fighting for the welterweight title, but I'm sitting here in front of you as a welterweight champion of the world, and it's because I have a great family, a great support system, um, great trainers, great wife. My mom has, you know, been the backbone of my life. So everybody's giving me the tools to be successful, and I think I can push that on to some youth in um, Ferguson. Go ahead, Brett. Uh, hey, Ty Tyron, this question might kind of sound like le out of left field, but there have been a lot of UFC champions lose recently. There's mm -hmm. just been a lot of turnover at the top. And I just wonder if you were – I know that you're self-motivated, you're completely self-confident, but do you take anything away from – you know, you're, you're booked as a challenger in a title fight and you see someone that's similar to you, like a Steve Miocic or an Eddie Alvarez or someone like that, win a title? I mean, does it, does it do anything for your confidence level seeing something like that? You know, I never really saw those guys as that, um, that large of an underdog. You know, Eddie Alvarez is a stud. He's been around the game for a long time. Um, Amanda Nunes, I've been telling people that forever. I said she can compete with a lot of the male Bantamweights in, in the 8th American Top Team. I just saw her stopping her, and everybody thought I was crazy, but I saw her stopping that fight. And, um, you know, just some of the other guys, I don't think it's a, a, a landslide. I, we get the entertainment aspect of mixed martial arts in the UFC, but it's also also people that are working their butt off and they're trying to be champions. So I don't think it's like the, the season of the underdog. But once all those guys won, I'm like, man, if I don't win, I'm going to break the streak. So, you know, it wasn't any added pressure. It was actually just something, you know, kind of we laughed about. And the same thing with Fox. You know, I'm one of the analysts on Fox. And all those guys either have had or currently have a belt. And it was my opportunity to go out there. And I didn't want to let everybody down. So I had to make sure I came home with the goal. And last thing, you know, to, to follow up on the, on the Nick Diaz comments and the George St. Pierre comments, will you do anything in addition to basically just publicly stating that's who you want next? Like, will you have a conversation? Those guys want to make money. I don't think – um, I'm not a guy that hates athletes. You know, 
Robbie Lawler is a guy that I admire. I love his comeback story. No other mixed martial artist has had a comeback story like Robbie Lawler. He came back, you know, he had a subpar record in Strike Force. He had some great moments, some bad moments. He switched weight classes. He came back and he went on a storm. I technically just beat the best welterweight in the world. It wasn't a guy out of his prime. It wasn't a guy that hasn't been on these three wars back to back to back. These guys are <coughs> legends. You know, Nick Diaz is the top five welterweight of all time in my, in my eyes. Um, George St. Perry is the number one welterweight in my eyes. If I'm an athlete in this sport, in this division, and I want to say I'm the best in the world, I feel like I should compete against those guys. So I don't feel any obligation to go by the rankings. We all know how those rankings are produced anyway. And I want to I wanna go out there and I want to fight the money fights. All right, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to take two more guys. We've got one right here. You went into the octagon early today. You were talking about visualization. What did you visualize when you were in the octagon before anybody else got into the arena earlier today? Uh, how you know I was here earlier today? Sneak, sneak attacking me. Um, <laughs> I like to go in the octagon to see if it's slippery, number one. Sometimes the adhesive spray is um, not as sticky as it is in other um, locations. Um, so I need to know where I can throw kicks from. I need to know if I go for a takedown, what I slide, if I'm on top ground and pounding, where my feet come from underneath me. I know it sounds crazy, but it's just something that makes a lot of sense when you're fighting. Um, also, I just want to feel the moment. You know, I want to walk in there. I want to see the stands empty. And I really, really, as hard as I can, I try to make the octagon and the stance empty when I go out there. So I don't have the pressure, I don't have the fans, I don't have the screaming. So when I walked out there, I saw a couple of celebrities, I saw a couple of friends, but then I went tunnel vision, I blocked everybody out, and I only heard Duke and, um, uh, only heard Duke and Dean Thomas. And also, I want to see the size of the cage. Every cage is not the same size. Some cages is like a 29, right? And the one's like a 30. 25 and a 30. Yeah, so that one was a, seemed to be a smaller cage. Um, so I, I know I need to... Get it's actually a bigger one. It. The bigger one? Yeah. Well, you made small. it small. Well, good. <laughs> well, I like to see that stuff because, you know, your, your heels hit that fence, and sometimes it's not a good thing against Robbie. And obviously one of the bigger storylines going into this was the whole American top team versus American top team. But for you, this has got to be special. You started with them. You've been through the whole thing, and now you've got the championship belt to take home. Yeah, you know, I think I'm the first product that they've produced from, from amateur. You know, when I first started with American Top Team, I wasn't even fighting yet. I was a collegiate wrestling coach. I was punching a bag here and there, and, and a buddy of mine who's actually here, um, he found um, Eve Edwards for me, and I started coaching him in wrestling. Then I started doing amateur fights. Then I started training Dean Thomas, Tiago Alves, and all the guys at American Top Team, and I used to get my butt kicked. I was a bag of bones, you know, Tyron come and spar this guy, Tyron come and spar that guy. I used to spar twice a day in it, with the heavy guys in the morning and the light guys in the evening. So with that said, I've earned my key to walk around with the American Top Team flag. You know, I've recruited for the team, and I've set up boots at NCAA wrestling tournaments and try to get people to join the team. You know, I got a lot of pride in American Top Team, and, and it makes me feel awesome that I can be one of those guys that say, hey, you can join this team. You can be a cardio kickboxing student and decide to want to fight, and you have a chance to be a, uh, a world champion. T. Wood, congratulations on the belt and your $50,000 performance of the night bonus. <laughs> we'll see everyone in Salt Lake City. Thank you.